Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's session of Frequently Asked Questions from the American Society of Hematology Annual Meeting. I'm Mary Jerome, Senior Director of Medical Communications and Education at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ajay Chari from the University of California, San Francisco. And a little bit later, we will also have Dr. Paul Richardson from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. We've invited these faculty uh, to be here with us today to answer some of the frequently asked questions we've received from patients and caregivers about the data presented at this year's ASH meeting, which was a lot. So let's get started. So we saw, Ajay, numerous studies that describe the use of biomarkers and other indicators as predictors of treatment outcomes or adverse events for newer therapies like CAR-T and bispecifics. So, so Dr. Chari, can you help us understand the implications of these studies? And in other words, what were they trying to determine and what did they show? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mary. First, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to you and the MMRF. Happy to be here. Um, and I think to set the stage, you know, many in the audience will be familiar with bispecific and CAR T's, which are paradigm shifting because we're taking patients T cells and we thought that these T cells really wouldn't even work um, in patients with advanced myeloma who've had many therapies. And we're, we're now getting response rates of 60 to 100, right? 60 to 100 is the new 20 to 30. So what the, bio, <laughs> what the biomarkers are trying to understand is uh, how do we do better and who, who's not fully responding? And, and the other thing we have to keep in mind is while responses are important, the, the even more important than the response is actually maintaining that response, what we call progression-free survival and overall survival. So what we're trying to unpack is we have these great new tools, but how do we figure out who's going to respond or not? Mm -hmm. And at a high level, um, you know, one of the limitations of these new studies is that most of them have been approved on the basis of single arm studies. We have a couple of randomized studies for CAR-T, but the reason I bring that up is that when you do a single arm study, anything that happens on that study, good or bad, it's hard to delineate whether that's due to patient factors, like did you put really sick patients on the study? Is it due to disease? Is it really bad myeloma? Or is it due to the treatment? And so one of the ways we can start unpacking that is to look at these biomarkers, which are basically various tests that are surrogates, right? Like if you have a certain laboratory test, does that predict for better or worse outcomes? And so one theme we're seeing, I would say across some many of these abstracts is inflammation. So inflammation is uh, evidenced by certain blood tests like ferritin can be very high, C-reactive protein can be high, uh, fibrinogen can be low. And so when we have these inflammatory markers, uh, those have been shown in several studies that were presented at ASH to confer worse outcomes, uh, both in terms of uh, potentially risk of death, but also remission duration. And so I think we need to understand now, again, I would, whether, I, the, the problem is uh, one of my majors in college was psychology. And what I, what I always remember from that uh, was that correlation and causation are very different, right? So if a laboratory is correlated with a particular outcome, okay, that that's a particular association, but whether mm -hmm. intervening makes mm -hmm. a difference is mm -hmm. yet to be seen, right? And so yeah. I want, when we talk about these observations, we need to make sure that patients don't take away the message that like, oh, because this is how we need to do something about it, because that is a next level of evidence, but right. the current mm -hmm. level of evidence suggests that patients with high markers can have uh, less durable remissions and um, potentially inferior outcomes, potentially also more blood count problems. Particularly we see with uh, CAR T's, right, that it can take up to six months to recover your counts. Uh, and one of the features may be these in high inflammatory state also uh, starting with low blood counts. Um, one thing that is not coming up consistently is the expression of the target. So one of the unanswered questions right now is we have three major targets that are being explored with um, T-cell redirection therapy, which is the broad rubric of either bispecific or CAR-T. And the three targets are BCMA, GPRC5D, and FCRH5. And one of the questions that's being asked is when patients get these therapies and you're getting 60 to 100, why do patients eventually relapse? Because uh, if these therapies are so good, what's the mechanism? And I think that is another area of exploration. So it's, we talked about the inflammatory markers predicting outcomes on the current one, but then what leads to progression? 
And some of that, again, you can break it down into patient disease and treatment. Um, one of the things that one might infer is that disease-wise, this is an arms race against myeloma. And when you target a particular antigen or target or protein, does the myeloma lose that target as a mechanism of escaping, right? So for example, BCMA, if you're repeatedly targeting BCMA, does the myeloma is like, oh, fine, you think you're going to come after me with BCMA? I'm just going to lose BCMA and escape your, your mechanism. And that is probably more seen as a general rule with bispecifics than CAR Ts because mm -hmm. bispecifics are repeatedly getting dosed uh, and that puts a lot of pressure, what we call antigenic pressure. Sure. With CAR T, it's more of a expansion and disappearance. So we're not seeing so much of loss and there was a couple of papers looking at the loss and, but we have to understand that the antigen is a complicated or the target is a complicated uh, structure. So you can have loss at the gene level. So uh, the, the, the protein's not even made, being made. Mm. It can be after the protein's made, there can be mutations in the protein that mm. can affect binding of the target uh, of the mechanism. So like if a bispecific is no longer binding to the myeloma because the protein has changed, that would be another. So that's another theme that we're looking at. But I would say the third part of this is maybe relates to the patient. So we talked about patient disease and treatment. And the patient factor in particular that seems to be coming up across multiple abstracts is the immune health of the patient. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about is how good are your snipers, your T cells that kill, but also how good are your like cloaks, right? So there is also T cells that block the immune system from killing. And so that balance of like your sniper to cloak, if you will, is another theme that's coming up as a potential risk factor for outcomes. Uh, but I think uh, I would say those are kind of probably some high level themes, but whether how we take that into the clinic and do we change inflammatory uh, markers, does that help? Uh, that's, I think, is a major question. Can we do something about the immune microenvironment, making the snipers more angry or getting rid of the cloak cells that protect the cancer? Those are going on. And I would say the thing that's probably the closest to prime time that we've seen in studies is that it does seem to make a difference about lowering the disease burden. So mm -hmm. if you go into CAR T with a bulky disease, that correlates with more inflammation. It can co correlate with more what's called cytokine release syndrome and ICANS, which is neurologic issues, and even some of those delayed neurotoxicity. So I think one thing that we are really mindful of is particularly with CAR Ts, because you don't get a, you don't get a redo, right? Like you get that slot, you collect the T cells, you prime the patient, get everything teed up, and you can't take it back. So you have to really be thoughtful about when to do the CAR T. Uh -huh. With the bispecifics, it may also matter, but the difference is that it's an off-the-shelf product and you don't have to give another dose, right? It's not like you're trapped into a corner, like, okay, you've got to give it now or not. And right. so I think um, those are some of the themes and the biomarkers, but uh, happy to take any uh, comments or questions from you or the Folks. Yeah, you know, I, th I thought that this was, I mean, this is really the first time that I've seen in a meeting where they're looking at biomarkers around these, um, these immune targets, right, around CAR Ts and bispecifics. But that type of work has been ongoing with other drug classes for quite some time. And, you know, the compass data that we've collected over the years for patients who have been taking some of these, you know, the, um, the IMIDs or the proteasome inhibitors and looking at all how patients have done based on their genomics, right, and then trying to use genomics to predict who are the patients who will respond best to these therapies and who are the patients that are going to, like you said, they will respond, but then they'll relapse quickly, right? Which is, um, you know, it's important to be able to figure that out, you know, upfront sometimes, because then you won't be, you know, giving some, giving a patient who might otherwise not, you know, respond to a drug, a drug that they're not going to respond to. So, um, you know, that kind of thing. And I just, I found that this session like particularly fascinating because they're really looking into those things, right? And this is, um, you know, because it's, it's already been ongoing work for such a long time with other drug classes. It's important, I think, to do it for these drug classes as well. Well, you know, I think we're both self-proclaimed myeloma nerds. So we think all of this is fascinating. <laughs> but one, I think, kudos to the MMRF that why this is so important. There was a really interesting paper that was published in Nature Medicine this year, looking at what happens to patients after bispecific and CAR-Ts. And, um, and that was in Nature Medicine led by uh, uh, 
great a friend and colleague, Nizar Bayliss's lab in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And what they showed, and they used the Compass data set, because when you look, if you want to ask this question of how common might the loss of BCMA or GPRC5D be, you need a data set. And guess what? The only like widely available, commercially, commercially available data set is your guys' is Compass. And so they mm -hmm. actually went back to Compass and, and looked at BCMA and GPRC in newly diagnosed patients and found that for BCMA, about 3% of patients have a loss of one copy. So keeping in mind that all of our, pro, our chromosomes have, we have two copies of all the genes. And so about 3% of patients have missing one copy of BCMA and about 10% can be missing one copy of GPRC5D. Those patients may be more susceptible to the double loss uh, mm -hmm. after bispecific therapy. And that's a good example of why we need to do these kinds of biomarker studies um, and collect that data and why Compass is so helpful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was used, it's been used so extensively throughout, you know, this ASH in particular. I believe we had 34 abstracts that, that utilize Compass data for many, many different things. Um, and, um, and it was involved in, I think, 12 oral presentations. So, I, I mean, and this is why we did this study. Right. Because people need this data to be able to figure things out in the field. Right. And really help patients. So and it's it's working and it's it's being utilized exactly as it was intended from the beginning, which is, you know, that's basically why we did it. OK, so let's move on a little bit to MRD. So we've been hearing a lot about um, me measurable residual disease or MRD for the past few years. And several researchers are trying to expand its utility either by using peripheral blood instead of bone marrow biopsy, which would be great for patients if we could do that, or by pairing MRD with other sensitive techniques such as mass spectrometry. So could you briefly review uh, for our listeners what MRD is and what data from the recent studies that we saw at ASH might mean for patients? Sure. Um, you know, I think the, the broad I would set up to this question is if our therapies are getting better and better and we're getting 60 to 100 percent and the remissions are getting more deep and durable, the techniques need to keep up because it's not just enough anymore to get rid of your M spike or light chain. You need to get deeper uh, measurements to understand the, you know, the potency of these new therapeutics. So uh, there was a really interesting abstract coming from the Spanish group who's done a lot of the work on MRD. And what they looked at <clears throat> is looking at this uh, minimal amount of disease, not in the marrow, but in the blood. I mean, if you ask the patients who here likes getting marrows, no one's gonna raise their hand, right? And we need to move away from this technique. Uh, uh, and so the, the, they looked at it in three different ways from the blood. One is by flow cytometry. Um, and it was a pretty sensitive technique. They claimed that it was 10 to the minus seventh. So uh, that's one in 10 million cells uh, being able to pick up myeloma. A second one was looking, a second technique they looked at is with DNA uh, to look at little microscopic particles of DNA coming from the tumor. And then the third technique they used is mass spec, which is, or immunofixation mass spec. And what that is, is basically, I always like, uh, you know, on those shows like CSI, if somebody's been killed and they want to study the blood and they're used the, like this mass spec to figure out what the proteins are to identify potentially the poisonous compound. It, it's the same technique. Mm -hmm. We have these really fancy protein detection techniques. And because myeloma is a plasma cell and it's a protein disorder, you could use these really sensitive techniques. So their question was, how do these blood-based techniques fare compared to the bone marrow? Um, mm -hmm. And what they showed was that uh, it, they, they didn't sample too many patients with the DNA. They, they mainly did more of the the flow and the immunofixation uh, and mass spec. Uh, so the mass spec and flow, what was interesting is that if you were double negative by both those techniques, that correlated with the bone marrow being negative in 86% of patients. And so what that means is you could potentially save 86% of patients from having a marrow. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think my, you know, and, and, and then there was another technique that also looked at this mass spec. So one of the challenges with mass spec is that it's so sensitive that you can also get other interesting findings. So for example, uh, they, this other technique from uh, the other group from Chicago looked at the mass spec and they were interested in seeing how early can you see the mass spec becoming negative after transplant? Does it correlate? And one of the things they noticed is that uh, if you're going to do it after transplant, you may need to wait up to 18 months. And the reason for that is hmm. the proteins that are made from myeloma, number one, can take a long time to clear. And so 
that's what we call like a half-life issue. So even if you take a magic wand and got rid of all the myeloma, the protein that's made may take a long time to clear, especially by these very sensitive techniques. If you use more rudimentary techniques, you may see it clear quickly, but the more sensitive you are, the longer it can take. And then the other reason that, that they, they purported it could be happening is that when you have a transplant and your immune system is recovering, you may have favorable features. Um, your immune system may be recovering favorable clones that are actually not necessarily myeloma, but there are antibody fragments coming from the immune re recovery, and that could be a good thing. So because of all of that noise, it can take up to 18 months to recover. And so I think this is really exciting field. I guess if you then zoom out, what is the take home message about MRD? Um, I think the challenge with this test is uh, how to use it correctly. I think no one will disagree in the myeloma field that it is correlating with prognosis, meaning if, if it's a prognostic test. So the deeper your remission, the better we think these patients will do. So MRD negative will do better than MRD positive. The challenge is how do we make that usable at the bedside, like to go from a prognostic test to a predictive test. So again, like the inflammatory biomarkers, does changing somebody from positive to negative uh, how much value add is that and at what cost, right? Like, cause if you're already doing very well, uh, then what, how much therapy do you need to throw in addition to get this person to convert negative? And conversely, can you start backing off? And I think some of the limitations of MRD, which is important to talk about, and that's why I would always caution patients to not over-interpret these. Uh, and this is what the FDA and the health authorities are wondering about is because the clinical trial that we've done so far you're not testing every patient, right? We're only testing people that we think are in complete remission. So it inflates the sensitivity of the test because mm -hmm. who cares if you're MRD positive, if you're MRD negative in the marrow, if you have disease in the blood, the urine on imaging, right? Mm -hmm. The second part is, is it sustained? And that's the hard part about doing bone marrow MRD. You're not doing it every week or every month. You're doing it every now and then. And mm -hmm. there can be sampling issues. If you get a pocket of myeloma, you'll hit it. And if it's, on the other hand, if you just got blood because it was a more of a dilute specimen, you're gonna get a false negative. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it seems to matter what kind of patient and disease you have. So if you have high risk disease, the MRD negativity really needs to be sustained and it can, it's, it may not be enough. We may need more tools um, and extramedullary myeloma, which is outside of the marrow. So what I'm getting at is that there are some nuances to MRD that make it a challenging test. So I think, uh, and I personally think part of the reason the marrow will be helpful in the future is not so much just for the myeloma, but for the immune microenvironment, because that's the test that you can't get from the blood. I think we can, these right. new mm -hmm. techniques will evolve to the point of getting it in the blood, but how, whether your immune microenvironment normalizes is something that I think the only the bone marrow can tell us. And, and that again is in very early stages. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work going on in that area as well. It's super fascinating stuff, right? What's happening in the microenvironment, right? And how that's either supporting or not supporting the growth of myeloma. So fascinating, fascinating things. Okay, so we'll move on to your next question, which is on new treatment combinations. So, um, so there were some results presented from studies looking at DARA combinations in newly diagnosed patients. They had the IFM, 2018-04 study, you looked at DARA, um, Darzlex, Kyprolis, Revamid, and Dex for induction and consolidation along with double transplantation in high-risk newly diagnosed patients. And there was the late-breaking presentation of the Perseus study, which is a phase three study looking at Darzlex plus Velcade, Revamid, and Dexamethasone in newly diagnosed transplant-eligible myeloma patients. So if you could review those for us, I, people were really very excited about this Perseus thing. So that was pretty cool. I was there for that. <laughs> yes, I think, um, you know, basically the field has been evolving to if you have an active drug, and I think many people ask us about bispecific and CAR-Ts, which are currently approved for four more lines of therapy, why can't they move up? Well, you need clinical trials because uh, it's one thing to show activity in the heavily treated population. It's another thing to show that it's superior to currently available therapies. And so with the CD38 monoclonal antibodies, daratumumab and isotuximab in particular, the first one, they were approved in 2015. Um, and the question is, you know, I think uh, for transplant ineligible, the Maya data was great. Dara, Revlimid, and Dex shows really amazing results. What's been a little bit unclear is what about the transplant eligible population? Because usually you're getting the chemo, 
transplant and then maintenance. And then what's the value add of a monoclonal antibody there, like a CD38? And in the US, um, you know, there's folks in two camps. They're like the early adopters that have been using it. And I think many of us in academic world have been using it uh, on the basis of a, what, what's called a ra randomized phase two known as Griffin. And that was a, a hundred patient study mm -hmm. And the primary goal there was just to show that it deepened the response, which was positive. But many people want to see more than that. They want really phase three, larger numbers, and longer follow-up, mm -hmm. and PFS, mm -hmm. which is progression through survival. And that's what Perseus gave us. So it's that yeah. mm -hmm. VRD versus the addition of DARA, triplet versus quad. Uh, and then after transplants, they got a couple of cycles of consolidation, and then maintenance. And I think the interesting part also is that the maintenance is a little bit nuanced. So Basically, uh, if you were assigned to get DARA, you got it in initial therapy and induction, and then in consolidation and in maintenance for two years. But after two years, uh, you could potentially stop if you were MRD negative. So it's not mm -hmm. that you get DARA forever, because mm -hmm. I think it is a lot to ask of patients to be getting an injection medication for a long period of time. I think many people are like, okay, I'm going to do my few cycles of initial yeah. therapy. I'm going to do the transplant. Yeah. And, and taking a pill for maintenance is one thing, but then to be asking people to yeah. go in is a right. tougher sell. But what this yeah. study showed, also, yeah. The, I mean, it's a huge cost issue as well, right? And that was yeah. some of the, of the questions after Perseus was um, presented was around the cost of therapy because Darzalex is a fairly expensive therapy. And if patients don't really need it, you know, should they really be having it, right? So yeah. it, it really sort of comes down, I think, to sort of being able to use some of these biomarkers that we were talking about earlier to determine who are the people who really need to have the DARS legs and who don't. Hello, Paul. Mary, very good <laughs> afternoon. Achai, thank you very much for, for helping out. I, I really appreciate it. No problem. Glad to have you join us. <laughs> but for pleasure, guys. Just a little crazy um, here because we had such a horrible yes. storm yesterday. Anyway, um, but there I we know, are. Right? But, uh, anyway, it wasn't bad here. Oh well, no, a whole bunch of our team lost power. <laughs> it's just like crazy. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. Anyway. I, okay. I think just so, the, the Ajay, only final point was that the, just to yeah. add that the Persia, the addition of daratumumab in that study showed a sixty percent improvement in the likelihood of progression or death. So that was, I think, the main take-home message uh, and how people interpret that mm -hmm. in terms of how long to use. DARA is going to be, I think, the main question that uh, we need to get more sure. information on. But that's why there was so much excitement. Yeah, agreed. So, okay, Dr. Richardson, now that you're here, okay, we're going to start talking about smoldering multiple myeloma. Okay, so we saw some results from studies uh, treating intermediate and high risk smoldering myeloma in an effort to determine whether there's a benefit to starting treatment for these patients. So we also saw some data providing insights on the genomics of high-risk smoldering myeloma. So can you tell us a little bit about what we learned about managing this precursor condition? And specifically, um, immunoprism, I thought, was some of the most interesting data that yeah. was presented in this group. Uh, um, really interesting stuff. Well, thank you very much, Mary, and, and, and lovely to see you, and, and also uh, super to be with you. Uh, Shy. I was just going to say, I think um, Omar Nadim from our team presented the immunoprism data, and it was fascinating because obviously what has struck us about teclistamab use in this smoldering high-risk population was <clears throat> the remarkably low rates of toxicity, which was obviously critical to the success of the project, because obviously what we couldn't uh, you know, uh, what we what we wanted to avoid at all costs was excessive toxicities um, and and any infections and so forth that could be uh, prohibitive. Um, instead, what we saw was a, a favorable picture of far fewer infections than we've seen in a relapsed refractory setting, um, which was encouraging. Um, and above all, the remarkably mm -hmm. high response rates and the MRD negative rate, which you <laughs> couldn't do much better. So the, the reality was that um, it proved feasible. Um, and so far, at least, um, relatively um, safe, which I think is essential. Now, recognize it's, it's still a source of relatively small number of patients, but the next phase of the study now is the randomized portion where patients are assigned to lenalidomide-based therapy or to the teclistamab. And I think that will help us really understand the value of the teclistamab going forward. But um, I, I'm personally very excited by this. There is a Another initiative from Irene and Omar looking at CAR T therapy in this group of patients. Personally, I'm a little cautious about that just because I think whilst CAR T is phenomenally active, 
there are toxicities that can be unpredictable and rare as they are, I'm a little bit cautious myself about that. But in terms of the um, teclistamab experience, I'm really excited and our group are too, um, to see the progress that, uh, that's being made. <clears throat> Yeah, so that's it was really interesting, um, and it'll be very interesting as they begin to move some of these uh, immunotherapies into earlier lines, right? So hopefully we'll have some of those um, approvals um, coming through soon. I know that the FDA is is thinking about these things, and and they also had some comments about secondary malignancies that might be resulting from some of the CAR T therapies. So I think we'll talk about yeah. that a little bit later. Yes, yes. I think that's I mean, be wonderful to have Archai's perspective here as someone who's really been in the trenches with CAR-T, both at Mount Sinai and now at mm -hmm. UCSF. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, my own experience from my own practice has been very favorable with regards to outcome in a select group of patients. But unfortunately, in my own experience with CAR-T, I have lost a couple of patients to uh, treatment-related toxicities, including, mm -hmm. uh, most importantly, late Parkinson's in one patient, which uh, has left me mm -hmm. a little bit sort of a little bit sobered. Um, she was in complete remission, MRD negative, and um, and and had done well actually through the procedure itself, um, but then very sadly developed the late Parkinson's, which was not treatable um, and not reversible, and she passed. So I think yeah. it's it's yeah. it's it's a it's a do we have to be careful? Yeah. Agree, agree. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, some of the autologous stem cell transplant data that was discussed at ASH. So there was a couple of interesting presentation on transplants. There was one looking at factors behind patients who might refuse to have a transplant and others looking at global dis uh, differences in age distribution of patients receiving transplants and how this affects outcomes after transplants. So Paul, what were some of the take homes from those presentations? Well, I think obviously um, transplant remains a standard of care for transplant eligible patients in the global uh, sense, especially to healthcare jurisdictions which don't necessarily have access to the novel therapies that we're so lucky enough to have available in the US setting. Um, so I think it's a mainstay of therapy, particularly in, in countries in Europe uh, and elsewhere. Um, personally, I think that the field is evolving. Um, there was a presentation actually last year's ASH, not at this year's ASH, which was an oral presentation by Christian Straka, which caught my attention then. And I know it's actually going to be published in a manuscript, hopefully fairly soon. But this was a German trial looking at elderly patients receiving a lenalidomide-based induction regimen and then early transplant versus delayed. And remarkably, and I was surprised about this, I was expecting to see a PFS benefit to the trial. It was large, but there was none. And there was no, no not only no PFS difference, but no OS difference. That would be expected. But the absence of PFS benefit was, was interesting. Um, I think the important point was this was tailored to an elderly population. So I think, to my mind, it was a randomized trial, well conducted. It was the German group who were rigorous and tend to do a very good job. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking about this and saying to myself, well, look, you know, what did we learn from determination? Clearly, PFS mm. wins, mm -hmm. hands down. Mm -hmm. But survival, actually, especially if you have access to novel therapies, um, in relapse remains mm. or the equivalent, recognizing we've got follow-up, you know, this remains mature actually, but still, you know, 10 years, you know, 10 year follow-up, that may be a little more definitive. My simple point is, as I think about this and I look at the success of CAR-T therapy and I look at the success of bispecifics in particular, and in particular bispecifics supported by immunomodulatory drugs, there was a wonderful presentation from Jeff Matus on Tapuetamab followed by pomalidomide, for example. The results were outstanding. I'm left with this feeling that you know, perhaps we should be thinking very carefully about high dose melphalan, given its excellent value, but at the same time looking to the future. And I kind of that's where I'm looking at this more broadly, I think, um, because cellular therapies really um, did impress me. And T cell redirection was particularly impressive, um, especially the work that we saw Achai and I saw together on, on, on Monday afternoon. I just wanted to add, I think, quickly that I uh, completely agree with Paul, um, but I think the variables we have to consider are efficacy, safety, convenience, cost, and patient reported outcomes, right? Those are the five determinants of yes. whether something's going to be used or not. And it's essential that we have randomized studies to move the field forward. Um, I don't think anybody's wedded to transplant, but I think we need to displace yes. it in a thoughtful fashion because if the access is limited, especially globally, right? Uh, 
transplants are very cost effective and have long-term follow-up data. And so as Paul's already alluded to with CAR-Ts, we are not fully aware of the long-term data yet in terms of the toxicities and Parkinson. So I think we really need to let the data guide us and not have like these emotional attachments. I'm happy to displace either one, but I would just wanna see which one is better because it can't just be this like, there's so much emotion I feel like wrapped up with these topics, but and some people are really pro CAR T and anti transplant, or vice versa. And I, I think we just should let the data guide us uh, in a thoughtful manner forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I so agree, actually. I think I think it's very true. But I also think we have to be very aware now that we're in a lucky space with myeloma, where we can think strategically. And yeah. I think that you know our patients are living 10, 15, 20 years, and I think we have to be very thoughtful about what that means. Um, and certainly um, one. Uh, aspect of high dose melphalan that we have to be thoughtful about is the long term consequences from the standpoint of myelodysplasia and mm. obviously the rare but real incidence of AML. And I think it's it's incredibly important to bear that in mind because I, I was impressed, for example, not at this year's ASH, but last year's ASH, Achai, from your group, the 70 patient real world experience for Siltus uh, cell and Ida cell. And in that group, you had a number of patients who had MDS, didn't you? And th they, they had had a lot of prior chemotherapy, including transplant. So I just think it just behoves us to be thoughtful. And I think my own bias in this is to be tailored to the patient. Um, because I so agree with you, um, Achai, the patient reported outcome is everything. You know, the quality of life, the toxicity considerations, all of these things matter. But at the end of the day, I'm also very, very persuaded um, by the fact that melphalan provides you an ability to target stemness that you really need to do, especially in high risk disease that's you know resistant to quadruple therapy. So if you don't get what you need to do with your quad uh, and you have higher risk features, I, I fully agree, um, Achai, the data would suggest that's a person in whom intensification with high dose melphalan should be offered. Okay. Um, let's see. So we were sort of moving around the agenda a little bit, Paul, because you weren't here. So now i got to make sure that I'm talking about all the things. Where are we? Okay. We talked about this. Okay. So now we're going to talk about new and emerging agents. So not surprisingly, there were several presentations on new and emerging agents being examined for their effectiveness in treating myeloma. For example, there was a phase 1b2 uh, study for sonrotoclax, which is a new BCL2 inhibitor that is more potent than mm -hmm. venetoclax, and HPN217, a tri-specific T-cell engager. So Dr. Richardson, what can you tell patients about these newest agents? Well, I'm going to take, if you don't mind, I'll take the BCL2, and perhaps actually I can very kindly opine on the tri-specific, because um, I, I think the BCL2 inhibitor was fantastic. I really like the data. It was present, presented by Dr. Hang Kwak, uh, and she's terrific. She's based out of uh, Melbourne in Australia, and it was really mm -hmm. compelling. Um, I, I firmly believe in the value of targeting BCL2 and T1114 translocation. And I think the story with the Netoclax is a cautionary tale in some ways, but also frustrating in another, because clearly we all feel the Netoclax works and it provides real benefit to our patients. Unfortunately, given the um, uh, challenges with the Bellini study, the first phase three yeah. in that setting, followed yeah. then actually by the um, unfortunate failure of Canova yeah. to meet Canova. its primary yeah. endpoint. Um, I know. We're, we're in a situation where we know it works, but we haven't proven uh -huh. it. Um, uh -huh. I think it makes the likelihood of an Adiclex being approved by FDA extremely unlikely, frankly, and I do understand why. I think the flip of that, though, is these next generation drugs. And for example, this is one, and actually there is a second one coming from Abvi, um, which is actually now under study. And the important point is these two next generation inhibitors, I think, will be more active safer and what Hang presented was extremely active. So I'm, I'm actually very excited. So I think it was a great step forward and <clears throat> just an oral therapy, which mm -hmm. has real world uh, uh, promise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Aj, the try specific Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, it's a really exciting time in myeloma because we used to have so few uh, drugs, but now with the BCMA targeting therapies, not only do we have two already approved Ticlostimab and Alranatinab, but also there's multiple other ones in development, uh, including Linvacitinab. Um, there's also an AbbVie compound. 
there's uh, also the this one called Harpoon 217, <coughs> which was presented. Uh, this is a different molecule. It's actually very small protein. Um, and it's so small that in order to make it stay in the system longer, they have to add a third component, which is albumin. It's just called a half-life extender. Um, but it's such a small molecule, but um, and so it's targeting BCMA like everything else. And I, I would say just in, if you look back at the whole space, I would say uh, with, I think there's six different products, it feels like the statins of myeloma, right? Like how many do you need? But the good <laughs> thing about this is I think this will hopefully drive down the cost and make access better, mm -hmm. right? Because again, globally, we need these products to go to all patients and not in restricted safe areas. So I would say efficacy wise, it's kind of striking how concordant they are. The the responses are 60 to 70% across the board. Mm -hmm. the progression free survival is interesting. Teclistamab is the first one out and has a pro progression free survival of around 11 months. What was interesting at this year's ASH, ELRA was updated and has a PFS of 17 months. And so mm -hmm. quite compelling, but just we want to avoid direct cross study comparisons. Um, I mean, I think there may be some slight difference there, but we, there's always differences in the patient populations and the lines of therapy and all of that. And it's sure. also, I think we're learning. And I think the what I mean by that specifically is with this class of products, and this was true seen of the Harpoon as well, we do see infections with this class because when you target BCMA, yes, you get the myeloma down, but you also get unusual infections, including severe infections. And because teclistamab was the first on the market, there is a rate of infection with the most recent data cut of 55% um, and with the current, with about a two year follow up almost. And, and so because of that, we've learned that you need to monitor for infections, hold the therapy if there's a severe infection, give IVIG, give preventative. And I think those interventions may be leading to better outcomes with the newer therapies because it's not like we're treating these people in absentia, we're learning from each product. And so I think the safety signal maybe looks a little bit better, whether that's due to the product or our experience, I think is the unanswered question. But uh, convenience is another difference across the products. Some are IV, some are sub-Q, some are monthly, some are weekly. So those, some have a step-up dose, some don't. So that's another differentiating factor. And then the last one I would say is that the cytokine release with this harpoon compound was quite low. It was only about a 25%, whereas most of the other compounds are 60, 70%. Um, and so I think how the dust settles, it'll be interesting, uh, but it's good to have choices in the short term. Absolutely. Yeah. So and I, there you I, go. There's Agree, Mary. Yeah. I just wanted to add a couple of comments. What sure. let me correct me if I'm wrong, um, Achai, but the infection signal was quite favorable, correct? It wasn't, I mean, obviously, perhaps people have gotten smarter at handling all the infections, but I just got the impression that the Harpoon platform, the rates of infection were perhaps a little bit lower than we've seen with other studies. But I don't know. Do you think that's just time frame and not being necessarily enrolling during the pandemic and that kind of thing? You know, no, I think absolutely that's part of it. But I'll say the big thing I, I always look at, if you're going to make cross-study comparisons, the follow-up duration is essential, right? Because the oh, infections true. keep adding up, right? And so if, oh, you, if you've only had an early data cut, you really can't say too much uh, oh, between yeah. the yeah. learning. So because these newer compounds have less follow-up, I think that's probably a major differentiating. Excellent point. Yeah, excellent point. Okay. So um, I think our last topic is going to be the next generation of IMIDs called cell mods. Um, and so we're, we saw some presentations uh, providing insights into their mechanism of action, looking at their effectiveness as maintenance, and also preliminary efficacy from a study that you authored, Dr. Richardson, using mesigdamide or mezi, um, Dara, uh, Darzalex, and dexamethasone in relapsed refractory patients. So, um, so what did we learn at ASH about um, these this uh, class of compounds, the cell mods? Well, um, I think a couple of things, Mary. I think most importantly, um, it's great to have uh, oral options for patients. We've already touched on the BCL2 inhibitor earlier, and I think that the value of having oral options improves patient convenience above all, and then actually um, access, because essentially you've got a truly outpatient therapy. And so obviously we, we had the really nice work done uh, led by Saga Loniel with iberdamide, and then we followed that with the mesigdamide story. They sort of moved in parallel, but in slightly different populations. And so um, Saga showed with iberdamide that we were getting around a 26 to 30 percent response rate in triple class refractory BCMA exposed patients with iber. When we moved into the space with mesigdamide, with actually slightly more heavily pretreated patients, our response rates were more robust. And this reflects actually the differences between them. I would caution Mary of thinking of them of thinking of them as 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 
glorified image. They're not. Mm -hmm. They're true cell mods. And what that means is that they're in the degrader class, and that's actually quite distinct. They're all monodacs, actually, what's called monodacs, molecular glues. But the, stro the, the immunomodulatory class, in terms of their molecular size, are substantially smaller. Mm -hmm. And their engagement of the cerebral E3 ligase complex reflects that. So let me give you an example. If you close the cerebral E3 ligase complex, it turns on the degradation rapidly of Icaros and Aelos, which are key transcription factors that not only control central pathobiology in the myeloma, but also activate the immune system when you degrade them. So this is an incredibly important switchboard. Um, what happens is with pomalidomide, that about, there's about a 20% closure of the cerebral E3 ligase complex. In contrast with iberdamide, it's around 50%. And remarkably, with mesigdamide, it's 100%. Hmm. So the degrading that mesigdamide drives is much, 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 much more uh, rapid, aggressive, and, 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 and effective, actually, as reflected in preclinical models. What's been gratifying is to take this to the clinic and see it actually translate for patients to their benefit. And I think what we've been struck by is iberdamide um, is very well tolerated. We have great data from uh, Niels van der Donk looking at ibertamide as a new strategy post-transplant, well tolerated and very interestingly driving up response rates and quality of responses post-transplant dramatically more than we've seen historically in different settings with lenalidomide. So again, to our choice points, we've got to be careful about cross-trial comparisons, but nonetheless, you know, the kind of CR rate improvement that we saw with IBA from Niels was remarkable. And so ibertamide, I think, is very attractive. Another interesting point about iberdamide is that it's not associated with the second cancer risk, or may not be, we should say, that lenalidomide or pomalidomide is, although pomalidomide perhaps less so. But lenalidomide interacts with what's called a P53 mutation in a way that can actually be quite challenging. Um, and so for that reason, iberdamide, we think, may be a new step up with less second cancer risk and more efficacy. Mesigdamide goes even further, has the same properties in terms of second cancer risk, hopefully being less, but above all, it's exquisitely active. So in our study, we looked at daratumumab combined with mesigdamide and mesigdamide combined with elatuzumab. When we combined mesigdamide with daratumumab, we looked at various doses and schedules, and we compared 0.3 to 0.6 milligrams of mesi, as we affectionately call it, and at the same time, did the same with elo. The ELOS cohort of patients were all DARA refractory, essentially, so heavily pretreated DARA refractory. And in that group, we saw excellent tolerability and about a 45% response rate, which was pretty respectable, actually, mm -hmm. and, and nonetheless, you know, encouraging, but still relatively modest, because what really struck us was with the daratumumab cohort. Now, they could be daratumumab exposed, but the patients entering that study could not be DARA refractory. So just to be a bit careful with that. So they weren't truly triple class refractory. They were at least double refractory. Still a, 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 an aggressive patient population and a median of three prior lines. So with that in mind, we saw actually a response rate approaching 90% in one cohort, um, around 84% in another, and around 65% in the third, recognizing that third cohort was early. So the overall response rate was 78% across the group as a whole. But I was particularly struck by the 89%. And then what really captured our imagination, Mary, was the duration of responses. In the lead cohort, our lead patients are 41, 42, and 43 months on therapy. Now that's wow. over three and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically our lower boundary of our DOR was 24 months. So that means that this DOR is going to be long. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, um, you know, this is so exciting when you compare it with what we can generate from biospecifics and what we can generate from CAR-Ts. And I think what we can think about here is that mesigdamide may really enhance the activity of biospecifics and may be a fabulous option to enhance the activity, say, of a CAR-T, particularly in higher risk patients where the likelihood of relapse may be, may be greater. So really Mezzi showing that it can partner um, mm -hmm. with different doses and schedules. Um, and, and we were able to look at the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics in the study quite comprehensively. My colleague Tracy um, Chang was actually the, the, the lead author on this. And she showed, Tracy showed very nicely that you could actually, um, you, you, you saw powerful effects on natural killer cells and T cells, um, which led to, um, you know, corresponded to the responses that we were seeing. So exciting stuff. Yeah.
Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, it, so as always, myeloma is a, um, a disease where combinations of drugs seem to work very, very well. Um, and so more to come on that, I'm sure, as more of these studies are done with the, uh, the cell mods in combination with other agents. So, okay. So um, I have one final question for each of you. Um, so thinking about what you saw in ASH this year, like in totality, all of the, all of the presentations that you saw and, and data that you looked at, what were you the most excited to hear about? And is there anything that will impact the, um, the patients that you manage sooner rather than later? later? Dr. Chari, I'll let you go first. Um, <clears throat> I think for the smoldering, what I really like about the immunoprism, uh, I think with the caveat, it's a small single arm study, so we don't have a control arm, but potency of efficacy was really unprecedented. We're looking at 100% response, 100% MRD negative. And not only are those numbers great, but what I think immunotherapy is how it differs. And this has always been my issue with treating smoldering myeloma because we don't have always the perfect models for who's gonna progress. And so I always have issue with starting a whole bunch of people on therapy for a long period of time. And we don't even know if we're helping them it's much more palatable to do a fixed duration of therapy because oh. that's how our colleagues in lymphoma, right? Like they're not treating, there's some cancer, they're going for curative intent and they're treating for a fixed duration. To be treating everybody with everything forever, I think it's just not a winning mm -hmm. strategy. So I would say that was super exciting. I think the CD38s in frontline to see the PFS data was exciting. And then to see the biomarkers and the real world data uh, I think what's also striking is, you know, these T-cell redirections that we talked about uh, today, the clinical trials are really cherry picking patients, right? Because you have to have perfect disease and no health problems. And we're yeah. seeing actually in the real world, and that's why the real world data set is so important to, yeah. to as a companion, we're mm -hmm. seeing really good results, but um, we're actually treating even sicker patients, obviously in the real world. There was one yeah. study that showed that 80% of the patients who got teclistimab in this one study were actually not eligible for the study as it was originally designed, right? Mm -hmm. And that just shows why we need these deliverability and <laughs> studies to partner with the clinical trial. So I think a lot of exciting data and hopefully we can piece this together. I think the hottest unanswered question is sequencing. How do you go from A to B to C? And I think that's, we're starting to see some signals on that. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, Dr. Richardson. Well, I, I think I 100% agree with everything Achai said. I think those were highlights for me too. Um, I think in addition to what Achai mentioned, I think there are a couple of things to add. Um, pivoting back to the cell mods a little bit um, with the um, promise that these are well-tolerated oral agents, I just see the promise of bispecifics really being enhanced by the integration of oral therapies that, to Achai's point, fixed duration of therapy um, so you minimize the toxicities of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a bispecific, and then an oral therapy that can maintain remission for a long period of time. And just acknowledging my colleague Tracy Chow in our work, what she showed was this incredible effect on T cells and natural killer cells from these oral agents to Achai's point. So as we think about myeloma being truly an immunological disease controlled by inflammation and all sorts of complex interactions, we've now got a toolbox that directly addresses that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, and I think as we tailor therapies, um, we need to be very aware of how complex the pathobiology of myeloma can be mm -hmm. and how individual it can be. Mm -hmm. And in that spirit, there was one a presentation by my, my colleague, Jeff Sonder, um, on our patients in the determination trial who are African-American. Mm -hmm. And it really caught my attention because it's an area that we've been trying to understand. And we were looking at Duffy Null to sort of better understand what Duffy Null means. Duffy Null, you can be Duffy positive or Duffy Null if you have West African heritage. Um, believe it or not, Duffy Null occurs in up to 60 to 70% of people of West African heritage. It's specifically West African. It doesn't just control leukopenia. It actually does a lot more in the context of cytokine homeostasis and inflammation. And so as we think about treatment, I'm just using this as an example, I think we can think carefully about tailoring our choices now for our patients as we recognize the complexity of pathobiology mm -hmm. in each individual patient. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, I think it was a great ash. There was the um, Duffy Null story on the one hand, which is a small piece, 
the incredible uh, breakthroughs that Achai spoke to. And then finally, I just wanted to share one thing that was the talk of the meeting amongst the investigators, but that is that Balantamab Mephidotin, you know, obviously released its results of Dream 7 as a press release, showing that truly Balantamab Mephidotin does have even survival benefit uh, in a large randomized phase three trial. We we're eagerly awaiting that data, mm -hmm. but it really was great to see a drug that I've always believed in actually re-establishing itself. And I think mm -hmm. that's another message, isn't it, Achai? This is never a zero sum game. We need all the drugs that we can possibly have for our patients because it's such a complex disease. And it was great to see Bella really, you know, stepping back into the uh, therapeutic armamentarium. Yeah, agree. So um, I want. So do you think, Dr. Richardson, that this will this will it was approved for a period of time and then it became it was then taken off the market? And do you anticipate then coming back on the market based on yeah, that? Yes, data? I, I I personally do based upon mm -hmm. the results of Dream Seven and the fact that they, as they released in the press uh, press release, it conferred survival benefit against a very strong comparator. And mm -hmm. This wasn't a weak comparator. This was Dara VD. Um, okay. versus belantamab VD and to see a survival mm -hmm. benefit, particularly for our older patients. One could envisage, you know, a patient receiving daratumumab, lenalidomide and dexamethasone as part of the Maya regimen up front, enjoying, God willing, years of disease control, then relapsing, and a perfect choice for a frailer patient in whom, you know, a bispecific or a CAR T may not be appropriate, could be Bella VD. And if mm -hmm. that can engender years of disease control, you can see that, to Achai's point, the sequencing and choices really matter. So, so I, th I think we need to really think creatively about that because, um, mm -hmm. you know, being held to the standards of CAR T and bispecifics is a tough one actually because it's so good. They but are. the point is, mm -hmm. you know, for many of our patients, that's not the best choice practically, socially, you know, in every respect. So, having the ability to really pick and choose, I think, is so so good for us to help our patients the best. Mm -hmm. Agree. So, I mean, patient quality of life is really coming to the fore at this point because there's so many different therapies that patients can take, right? And um, and patients and doctors want to make sure that what they're thinking about, you know, the next line of therapy is going to be agreeable to the patient <coughs> on their particular, you know, their particular biological qualities, their what there's what's going on in their life, the things that they like to do, the things that they want to do versus, you know, whatever. Um, you know, some type of, of limitations that'll be put on their activity based on whatever therapy they're going on. But quality of life is really moving, I think, farther and farther forward in these considerations for patients, which I think is a good thing, right? So, okay. So on behalf of the MMREF, I'd like to thank Dr. Chari and Dr. Richardson for joining me today. I'd also like to thank everyone for taking their time out of their day to watch our presentation. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors, 270 Bio, AbbVie, Adaptive Biotechnologies, Baxter, BMS, Cure, BSK, Janssen, Carrier Farm, Pfizer, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda Oncology uh, for their sponsorship. So if you have any additional questions about anything you heard today, please don't hesitate to contact our MMRF Patient Navigation Center. Their phone number is 1-888-841-6673. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.